in the back corner over there because it was closest to the door and I could get in that door that uh, I would be the first one out but when they started singing uh, I was it really moved me the the singing of people people just singing with enthusiasm, and I thought, man, something is going on here. And that just really changed my heart with the singing, and it just so happened that uh, Pastor Otis here is, he was in charge, he was the chairman of the music department of that Bible school. He also had several uh, singing groups that he would take on missions, trips, and so forth. And uh, when I left uh, Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College, we never saw each other again for what, 30 some years until we met last year for the first time. I wondered oftentimes what was going on uh, with uh, you and how, what your path was taking you, but was really, really glad then to hear about what uh, he and Gail are doing as far as uh, families and, and uh, the ministries here. So he is now the co-founder of the Heritage Builders Global. It's kind of an answer to my prayer and uh, um, it's like one of these things, <clears throat> you, you, you try to do everything right in your family. Every dad and mom wants to do everything right in their family. And then they get grown up and you go, oh man, I must not have gotten it right. Or on the other hand, maybe you did get everything right. And um, it just didn't work out like you thought it was going to. So <clears throat> now I'm old, my family's gone. And I look back and I think there are some lessons that I could have learned and it would have been very helpful for me if I had learned them a long time ago. Um, so I say that to say this, it doesn't matter where you are on this age scale. I think the, the message that uh, uh, Pastor Ledbetter has for us tonight is very appropriate for this time and this place, especially here in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has some real gender issues that they're trying to work out, mostly in, in the political arena. Governments have no business trying to figure out morals. That's where we're, that we're, what we're supposed to do. Yet, we have to, this is the world we live in. We have to deal with these things. So, um, uh, I'm gonna have a word of prayer, and then um, we're going to uh, begin this, and uh, I trust that God will really use this time that we spend together to be an encouragement and a help to you. And uh, more than that, here's the thing. I mentioned this this past Sunday. We may not, uh, you may not be a missionary, or maybe you are. Uh, maybe you're not an evangelist and a, 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 a preacher of some sort. But you know something? We each have our circle. And the closest circle we have is our family. And and uh, I don't know the math, you, you know the math, I think, that if, um, if we would, each generation, just reach our family, we could profoundly influence and change our culture that we're in. We don't have to win the whole world. If we'll just win our family, uh, we can have a profound influence. So uh, again, this is, it, it's very personal to me, very close to my heart. This will not be the last time that we meet and uh, just barely the first time. So uh, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? And then I'm gonna ask Pastor Ledbetter to come up. Uh, Father in heaven, you know, just the fact that we call you Father, that really ought to tell us a lot, that we are in a very personal, intimate relationship with you as Father in a family. We are your sons and daughters. And uh, Lord, you reached out to us and you've brought us close to you. And then in your grace and in your uh, amazing work in our life, we too also have the opportunity to, uh, to raise children, to have an influence upon them. And God, I pray with all my heart that you might use us then to uh, reach out to our children to raise a godly generation, and not just to raise a godly generation, but to raise a generation that will continue on to pass this wonderful message of the grace of God as uh, to, to their children, to their children, and to their children. So uh, we wanna just take a moment and dedicate this time to you. We wanna take a moment and dedicate our lives, our hearts, and our attention, and ask you that through the scriptures that you would speak to our hearts. And God, I pray especially that, uh, that you would be with Pastor Ledbetter as he speaks, understanding that uh, this is um, 
Um, he should be sound asleep about now. So keep him bright, keep him alert, and Lord, may we follow along in the words that you've given to him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've prayed for you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Um, I've been praying, and we talked about coming and, and talking to your church. Um, I've been praying that God would touch somebody's heart. And I realize at, at a meeting, specialized meeting like this, that the busiest people in the church are going to be here. You already have ministry. You already have a direction that you're going, but I've been, Gail and I have been praying that God would choose at least one couple. One couple that would catch this vision of family and say, you know, that's probably where God wants me to be, and you would be the one losing sleep over family ministry and not him. When I began this in my church, that's what I looked for. I looked for one person that would lose sleep over what we were doing. And sure enough, God gave us the right people. And I believe he'll give you the right people here too. I just want to reiterate what uh, the pastor was saying. <clears throat> uh, the family is the single cell of society. Um, if the family is the single cell of this ministry. And if the single cell is weak and diseased, then the body's going to be weak and diseased. But if the single cell is healthy, then the body will be healthy. I realized that in my church when I left Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College, uh, the church in Fresno, and I, I want to show you a picture of them a little bit later, uh, called, and I've been there, we've been there 33 years. It's the only church I've ever pastored. It's the only church I will ever pastor. If I leave there, I'll retire and probably do this full time. But when I got there, uh, my wife and I, honestly, we wept for two weeks. Not because we were happy. Uh, we left a really good job where we had proved ourselves. We were accepted for who we were. Um, and we went to a very, very unhealthy church. About 75 people in that church. Um, mean. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing meaner than uh, Christian people who are out of the walk with God, and uh, they're, they're just mean. She got phone calls at home, just mean phone calls. And I said to God, why did, why did you do this? Why did you take us from where we were really happy to a place as unhealthy as this? And uh, I spent the, the first months counseling. Um, part of my job at Pacific Coast was counseling. They would bring students to me there, and, and I did counseling. Well, when I got to church, it seems like that was all I was doing. It felt like they were standing at the door and lined up down the street. That's, that's what it felt like. That wasn't true, what it felt like. And I realized this was an unhealthy church, and it was an unhappy church. And unhealthy sheep, an unhappy sheep don't reproduce. And so what you got is a, is, is a, a declining uh, number of people, and they were already at 75 and headed downhill. Um, so I, uh, I, I was uh, working with a church consultant, was in, on a board with a church consultant, and I thought, well, you know, here's a chance. I got a free church consultant, so well, at a board meeting or something, I'll just ask him about my church and what to do. And uh, so I, I cornered his name was Dan Brocky, and I cornered, and cornered him, and, and I asked him, I said, look, I've got real, real difficulties at a church. He said, well, Tell me, tell me about the church. Just tell me. I said, well, I can tell you about the church. In, in, in a very short description, it's a very unhealthy church. It's a very unhappy church. He said, hmm. Well, I can, uh, I can tell you what you need to do. Okay, <laughs> I need somebody to tell me what to do. He said, the first thing you need to do is you need to make that a happy church and a healthy church. what you need to do 
And he knew unhappy people, unhealthy people, that means families are unhappy and unhealthy. So that's when the first book came out. It's, it's called Your Heritage. Um, and most of the things I'm going to give you tonight are found in that book. And by the way, uh, I'll, I'll give you a website. You can go and you can download that book for free. Um, there's several free things that you, that you can get off of that site. Um, so you don't have to. I'm not here to hawk books. I'm not here to sell books. I already sold enough of those books to put one kid through college and get two kids married off. And that's where I spent the money for that book. So <clears throat> I don't have any more kids to marry off and, and uh, uh, any more kids going to college. So we're giving it away free now. So you can go online and get it for free. And some other resources I will tell you about and show you about a little bit later too. But that's what I started to do. I, I made my aim to start making that a he happy church and a healthy church. And today... If you if you went there, um, let me get let me get my uh, everything back to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, I'll show you a, a picture of the church. If you were to walk into the church today, uh, what you would find is one of the most friendly churches you would you've ever been to, one of the most healthy churches you've ever been to. And happy, happy church. It's like when I, uh, 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 when my tires hit the approach to the driveway every day, every Sunday, makes me smile. To be there with a group of people who love the Lord the way they do. And we're busy planting churches. We're busy finding families and helping families. And our brand is family. That's our brand. Everybody in our community knows that if you go to Sunrise Church, that our brand is family. And um, uh, they're praying for you. They prayed for you. They know I'm here. La the last Sunday I was there, Gail and I, they called us to the front. And uh, the prayer team and the, and the board prayed over us, prayed for this meeting, prayed for that person that God is going to choose to be the champion of what of what we're going to talk about so um one of the i, I want to introduce you to the church and and uh, when they get uh, the the uh the, the powerpoint up i want to introduce you to my family because when i go places and they and i tell them we're going to talk about family i'll always get somebody to raise their hand uh, uh, yes sir well before you tell us about uh how to how to raise a family tell us about yours <laughs> Because if it doesn't work for you, how is it going to work for me? And I want to—I just want to show you a picture of uh, of my family. If uh, um, uh, at, at some point, and I want to tell you that they're all working in ministry. They're not called, as far as a pastor is concerned. In fact, I'm 71 years old, and I would like for one of them to follow me and take the church. But they've all said, "Pop, we don't have a call." And I said, well, if you don't have a call, you better, you, you better stay out of the pastor. Uh, and uh, so they are staying out. But my son, who will be speaking Sunday when, uh, when I'm gone, uh, he, he and his wife are, are the children's pastor. Now, they have a real job. He's, he's in the, uh, the medical field, and she's in the insurance business. And they have real jobs, but they... They do the children's ministry, okay? Are you running off of mine? Oh, okay. Here's, a, here's the church. Here's Sunrise Church. All those people are praying for you. And I said our brand is family. This is our motto here. Strengthening God's family by strengthening yours. If we can strengthen your family, then we've strengthened God's family. We've made a happy church and we've made a healthy church. And if you walked into that church, you would be greeted from the time you went into the front doors, and uh, uh, I, I think you would. Uh, I think you would be impressed that this is a happy church. This is a healthy church now, which it wasn't at one time. And then the next slide is my family. Um, we're all standing out. I think this is uh, it was a Mother's Day, uh, uh, and we all gathered in the front yard and set it up. And I, I just want to. I just want to point them out to you. Uh, on the far right. That's my son, Matt, and his wife, 
and his four children uh, standing right there in front of them. Uh, Matt and Joy are the children's pastors of, uh, of, of the church. They do a phenomenal job. Uh, the, uh, the fellow on the far left, uh, that's Justin. And Becky, standing in front of him, that's my daughter. That's my first daughter. And all of her kids are around him. Justin, is uh, he owns a media company, Fenceline Media. And that's what he does. He worked for ABC Disney for a while. And uh, then after uh, he got all the learning and all the contacts, he started his own business and is just doing phenomenal. But he and Becky run all of our audiovisual. He does uh, some of the greatest uh, uh, video work. I mean, when you sit there, you, it's like you're watching Disney. Uh, he does that kind of work. It's first class work. And uh, um, he, that's his ministry, and that's Becky's ministry. In fact, our announcements every week, they end the service with the video announcements. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's just fun to watch. Of course, uh, Gail and I are in the middle there with the others. But uh, the young man uh, that doesn't have any hair in the back, uh, that's uh, my son-in-law, uh, Josh. And right in front of him is my baby, my, my youngest uh, uh, daughter, Leah. And they lead worship in the second service. Uh, he's the worship leader in the second service on Sunday morning. They play instruments and sing in the worship team in the first service, but they lead the worship in the second service. Um, and uh, all of those grandkids. Now, the fellow that's got a hold of the tree back there uh, and the two ladies in front of him, that uh, one is her sister, Linda, and the other is her uh, niece, Laura. And David uh, was... Uh, uh, atheist, the atheist of the worst kind, and he married into the family. And uh, Laura was so far from God at that time, if he hadn't been atheist, she wouldn't have married him. Uh, she, ran, she was running from God. And uh, he, he was in the army, he was a sergeant, a staff sergeant in the army, and God started working on his heart. A lot of prayer went in, into him. God started working on his heart. He would call me. We would have two-hour talks. I discipled him over the phone while he was out in his Humvee. Uh, he was a mortar specialist, and he taught, and he over, overlooked uh, the live fire activities, whatever they do, and then he would report to the superiors on it. But sometimes he was out there by himself in his Humvee and his uh, sleeping bag, and he would call. And God was talking to his heart. Uh, we were at Disneyland one time and uh, just decided to go down for, some, for a break. And we were there, the phone rang, and I looked, I said, this is David. And I said, you want me to take it? We're in Disneyland. It's going to be two hours. It, it won't be just a ten-minute talk, two hours. She said, take it. I sat down on the bench there. She went off and did something for two hours. I discipled him all over the phone. We did that. But uh, he came to the Lord. I got to baptize him. His faith now, he's at uh, Fresno Pacific University in philosophy. He's brilliant brilliant scientist type guy and uh, but now he loves the Lord and they're in ministry what did he do he hooked up with Justin he's now in the crow's nest and helps in the audio visual uh, and is uh, is a, um, a, a, a growing growing believer that's my family that's all my grandkids now um, not all of them that's 11 of them and I just want to tell you my my first 10 grandkids Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We're all girls. The first ten, and I'm thinking, can't one of you drop a boy? Okay? Uh, we we got to have some, I thought I was going to have to go buy a boy dog uh, in order to get another male in the family. And my youngest daughter said, don't worry, Dad, I'll get your boy. And uh, then Jack-Jack, number 11, down there, Jack-Jack came along, and then Fenton, sitting on Gail's lap, is number 12. So the last two are boys, so, you know, and that's it. I don't think there'll be any more uh, grandchildren. I think they're done. I have three kids. They each have four kids. So we're doing our job to populate, and uh, they, are, uh, they are a delight. But that's, that's the family. I wanted you to meet them. And what I want to talk to you uh, about Tonight will be 
the why of family ministry, the why of family. And then tomorrow, I want to talk about the how. And this is, this is how I frame it. There's real magic when you learn why. There's magic in why. Why do I do this? Why do we do this? Why family ministry in this church? Why these things that I'm going to give you today? Why, why, why? And a lot of times we spend too long on why. But there is a real magic in why. When I, found out, when I find out why, the next thing I want to know is a how. And the power is in the how. And we're going to lay some things out for you. Now understand, this is a way that has worked. It's not the way. So you need to take everything that you hear and process it yourself and find out what you can use and what you can't use and whatever you can't use, throw it away. But you're going to get into the how part tomorrow and that's the fun part. The why part is the part where we, we drill down and I think it's going to come at you like getting a, a drink out of a fire hydrant. I want to give you some statistics and these statistics are... Um, uh, have to do with uh, uh, where I'm from, the culture of the United States of America. But I don't think it will be much different than where you're headed yourself to. So in, in, in the National Evangelical Statistic, here are some things. The total church attendance in the United States we found decreased over the, la over the past decade. People go to, don't go to church as much. The Protestant membership has declined 9.5%, while the population has increased 11%. 50% of the churches in the United States are plateaued, or they're in decline. 50%. In 1993, evangelicals comprised 11% of the population. By the turn of the millennium, it dropped to 8% of the population. And the Billy Graham Association, everybody knows who Billy Graham is. Billy Graham Association, Tom Renier, uh, did a survey and they looked at the different generations and if you see there's the builders those are those are the ones born from 1910 to 1946 they're the world war ii uh, uh, people the boomers are born from 47 to 64 the busters born from 65 to 76 and the bridgers born from 77 to 94 then you have the xers and the millennia millennials and and the mosaics and all of those, I mean, whatever you want to call them now. That, that, uh, uh, but the statistics are, are the same. The builders, if you ask them how many, um, if you surveyed them, and they did survey them, how many of you believe that a God really exists and you can have a personal relationship with God? 65% of the builders said, we believe that. Now, go to, no, uh, leave that there, um, that, that bottom one, yeah. There's 65%. Now, what's the, what's the decline? One more. Yeah. Now, see the boomers? 35% said, we believe there's a God and you can have a personal relationship with him. That's the babies of the builders. The babies of the boomers, the busters, 15% said, we believe that there's a God and you can have a relationship with him. And the bridgers, those are ones that are going to bridge the, the generation of, uh, of, for the millennial. It went down to 5%. Now, what does it tell you when you see the 65% the, the and then you see the 5%? What does that say to you? What it says to me is that we have been unsuccessful at passing our faith to the next generation. For whatever reason, we have not got our faith into our children. And that's what it is. And that, is, that has stayed there static through the millennials. They think the trend may be coming up a little bit, but it's not coming up much. So... Uh, who are the true seekers in church? If you, if you, if you go to the next one, uh, the true seekers that, will come, that would come to our churches there is an estimated that 85% of those who accept Jesus Christ as, as Savior do so before the age of 18. That's really important. That's an important statistic for you to think about. 85% accept Jesus Christ as Savior before the age of 18. There's a 32 or 33 percent likelihood of a person accepting Christ as Savior between the ages of 5 and 13. By the time a child is 9 years of age, the moral compass is already set. By the time they're 13, statistics show us that a child will die believing what they believe at age 13, unless there's divine intervention. 
between the ages of 5 and 13, that's when they're going to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. What does that tell you about your church? Where should you be putting your money? That's right. That's right, because that's where you're going to get the... It drops to age... It, it drops to 4% between the age of 14 and 18. And it rises... When a child becomes an adult, it rises to 6%. About at around the age of 19, it stays static for the rest of their life. It doesn't matter if you're 95, you're in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60 years of age. The likelihood of you coming to Christ at that age is about 6%. That's it. And as many as 70% of young people, and the, some statistics are even higher than that, but as many as 70% of young people that are raised in church, in a Christian home and raised in church, have not embraced the faith as their own by high school graduation. If they have, many of them, when they get into college, some professor or somebody uh, brings doubt into their heart and they leave the faith. It's frightening. It's frightening. And you know, when I was here in August and I talked about this statistic, the people here in Taiwan say that statistic is probably exactly where they are here in the United States. We're losing our children. Less than 4% of those attending Sunday services are new seekers. You say, well, we're going to win people to Christ. We want people to come in. We want to win them to Christ. And I'm for that, and I think we ought to. But the, there's only 4% of people in your service uh, over the course of a year. 4% are true seekers that are looking for that. And let me give you this statistic. And this is, a, this is one that... Uh, uh, one of my partners who is an engineer, he's an engineer type, and, and he sat down and figured out the al algorithms, whatever it is to all of this. If a denomination only passed their faith to their children within their church walls, and they had no one else come in, and nobody else came into that denomination, they locked the doors and, and uh, built up walls or whatever, and they only passed their faith to their children within the church walls, they would more than double their current size within one generation, assuming that 60% of those people have children. If you reach your own children, you would automatically grow. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. Everything I'm going to give you, and we're going to do some evaluations and some things together. We're going to have some fun. The fun part really is more tomorrow than to today like i said today we're getting into the why but here here's here's the truth the church home link the church and home are interdependent it's not independent and not dependent interdependent institutions that are ordained by god the church home link etc if the church provides education and training and community that strengthens families in their relationship to each other and to God, then it will result in families' involvement in, back into and commitment back to the church's ministry and outreach. But first, you have to provide the education, the training, and the community. Now, the impact measured by disciplines in Deuteronomy 6, we're going to see this a lot. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these commandments I give you today should be upon your hearts. So impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And it also says, tie them as symbols on your fingers, like the proverbial string around the finger. Put them as frontlets before your eyes and write them on the doorpost and the gates of your house. So it's telling you four ways for you to pass the faith to the next generation right there in that scripture alone. It says verbalize it, you talk about it. What we would say in, in where, I'm, where, where we're from is you uh, talk about them when you sit at home and in the minivan. <laughs> wherever you're taking them to soccer, wherever, you talk about. What do you talk about? You talk about the Lord that you love with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You verbalize it. The second one, you symbolize it. What, is, what's, what do you do when you symbolize it in the home? We want to talk about that. The third one is that you visualize it. How do you help that child visualize this truth? How do they visualize their love with all their heart, mind, and strength? And the last one is you journalize it. You journalize it. You write. I try to get people to write all the time. I try to get my church to write. 
Write down what your faith is. Write, write it down because when you're gone, you can speak effectively to your children from the grave when you're gone. If you have written it down. And they know what was important to you. And they know what meant so much to you. My, uh, my wife's mom, she's been gone now for three years. Before that, she was gone for ten years. She had dementia. And uh, we saw it happening. It just crept up on her. And she would say, I think I'm just losing my mind. And we knew we were going to have her for a while. We didn't know how long. But we knew we were going to have her physically, but we're going to lose her. And we did. There were years. It wasn't her. At the table, she wasn't sitting there. Every Sunday, uh, our family meets uh, around the table. We have 22 21, 22 around the dinner table, lunch table every Sunday after church. And she's not there now. And Grandpa passed it a couple of years ago. He's not here now either. They were huge influences. But you know what she did when she knew she was losing her mind? She got three, three ring binders. And all of the things that my children had sent to her, all the birthday cards, all the times that they wrote her about what they did in school and how they were learning in school from the time they were little, she had kept all of those. She took the time to write how her and Grandpa met. She took the time to write what her faith was and why she was a Christian and why she came to know the Lord. She took the time to write all of this down and she put them all in three ring binders and handed them back to them. All these notes that they had given to her and her response to them and when she went into darkness, and that long goodbye, they could always refer to that three ring binder. They still have it now. And they can look back and they know what grandma believed. They know what was important to her. They know how important they were to her because she told them. In this, that, is, that is journalizing. That is writing it down for the next generation. And you know how long she's going to be able to speak from the grave? They will pass that to their children. Who will pass that to their children? Because don't we all want to go back and learn where we came from, where our DNA is? And who, who, who are we? That's our identity. And journalizing is important. And he says, write it on the doorpost and on your gates, which is a public place. He didn't say, write it in a journal, hide it under your bed. It's a public place. The door frames and your, and your gates are public. That's where people... Let people know what you believe by journalizing. Now, these are, these are some important... And so, uh, we all wear hand-me-downs. Now, if, if there was any scripture, if God came to me and said, uh, Otis, you know, if, if whatever scripture in the Bible you don't like, I'm going to let you take it out. I would go here. Now, he's not going to do that. But this is where I'd go. And why? Because, why this one? Because I just think it's so unfair. Why should I pay for something I didn't do? In Deuteronomy 5, 9 through 10, he says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the father to the third and fourth generation. That doesn't sound fair to me, but it's a truism, and we know it's true. We know alcoholics tend to raise alcoholics. We, we know abusers tend to raise abusers. We know liars raise liars. We know screamers raise screamers. We know all of that. That's true. It's a truism. That's what happened. Look at Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Abraham used the lie about Sarah. Isaac said that's a good one. He used the same lie that his dad used about his wife. Uh, uh, he used it. And then look what Jacob did to them all. He was the biggest trickster of them all. Lying about and getting the birthright. Punishing the children for the sins of the father of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But this is what's so beautiful. But showing love to a thousand, that's a thousand generations. We haven't had a thousand generations in the history of the earth. So the good things you do far outlast the bad things that you might have done. So keep that in your mind. While we're here. Now, what I want to talk to you about is the heritage. And now we're in, we're going to get into your, into this outline. And 
we're going to go, that was all the introduction. How long did that take? <laughs> um, but I, I want to get into this, and I want to drill it down, and I understand you're going to get so much information that uh, you're going to have questions, and I, I want your questions. And we'll stop and have time for questions. And if I get to a point, and, and I've got, you've got too much, and there's a question that just has to be answered, please let me know. And we'll stop. <clears throat> this is an informal setting. We'll stop and we'll start talking about this. But I want to talk to you about how to be intentional about the legacy you leave. How to be intentional about the legacy you leave. You are leaving, uh, you are live, uh, living a legacy, a heritage, and you are leaving one. You cannot opt out. Now let that, let that soak in. You are living a heritage and you are giving one. You cannot opt out. If you try to opt out, then the culture will elbow its way in and pass its own bread and heritage into your family. And that's what's happened to a lot, to a, a, a lot of people well, from where I live. And there's, I have three goals. And those goals are, are this, through, uh, through this uh, six hours we're going to be together. The first goal, I want to help you strengthen your roots by understanding and passing the good aspect of the heritage you were given. Well, I don't know how good it is, and I don't know how bad it is. We're going to evaluate that. I've got evaluations that we'll take. We'll evaluate how you perceive the heritage that you were given. So we're going to try to help you strengthen your roots. That's the first, that's the first step into happiness. That's the first step into healthy uh, relationship, is strengthening the roots by understanding and passing the good aspects of the heritage you were given. The second thing is to let you break the cycle of hurt by leaving behind the bad. And I just want to pause here, uh, and I, I speak at a lot of places. We were, we were in Ecuador a year ago, um, April. Uh, went down to a church down there uh, in Latin America. The family's just falling apart. And they, uh, I was speaking in Waikio in a, in a building, uh, in a breakout session about this size there was a guy sitting over there and when I took a breath in the breakout session we had talked about the church being the support role of the family that he raised his hand and I called on him he said you and I need to talk that's all he said well I didn't know am I in trouble did I say something that I shouldn't have said did I cross a cultural barrier or what but he pastors a church in uh, Quito a church of about 7,000 and even though that church grew to 7,000, the families in that church were unhealthy. And he realized that he had done it wrong for all these years. He apologized to his church. He resigned his church because he, didn't, he did not teach them about family. He taught them something far different than that. They asked him to stay, and he, he had us come down, and we, we helped him set up family ministry for that church, and it is unbelievable. In the Latin community, the Latin community, the man is the head even if he's a, even if he's a, a wart, you know. If he's wrong, he's still right. And that's what they told me when I was there. That's what they said to me. Even if he's wrong, he's still right. And a man is the leader of the home, and they believe that, but he doesn't lead the home. He delegates it to the wife. And he tells her how to run the home although he's not involved in it to do it. And he told me, Pastor Fernando Lay, he told me, he said, probably at this meeting all we'll get is, is the female because the husbands will tell them to come. And we prayed for 500 men to be champions in that church. And we prayed and prayed and prayed for 500 men. And uh, the, the place was packed every, every night. It was a week long. It was packed every night. And they started a college, uh, they call it a family college. And we haven't reached the 500 men, but he sent me a picture the other day, and there's 250, 300 men now in that college who would not before. And now that church is beginning to turn uh, and uh, do some incredible things. I think it's going to be uh, the leader in Latin America for family ministry in the churches down there. But when I was there, when I said this, to let you break the cycle of hurt by leaving behind the bad, and I talked about, you know, if you've had a history of abuse in the family, 
physical abuse, sexual abuse, whatever. It's hard to leave that behind. It's very difficult to leave that behind. But you've got to break that cycle of hurt. And somebody said, yeah, okay, it's easy for you to say. Have you ever been raped? Have you ever been sexually abused? Have you ever been abused? And I said, no, I, I, fortunate for me, I haven't. But I do know the Bible is true. And he told us he could turn our, our curse into a blessing. In Deuteronomy, I think it's 23.5, he says, I, the Lord your God, can turn your curse into a blessing because I love you. And it's time people take the bad, leave it behind, and understand that God can take whatever was a curse to you and he can turn it into a positive. And how he does it, I don't know. I just know that's what he said and I know he can do it. I want you to leave behind the bad because if you keep the bad with you, you know what you are doing is you are passing that bad without really wanting to. You are perpetuating the bad that happened to you into your own children. So I want to help you leave, break that cycle of hurt and leaving behind the bad. I'm going to show you how to do that. And the third thing is I want to assist you in charting a new course as you build a positive heritage for those that you love. And we've got some charts and some things that will help you do that. And um, uh, then again, there's that scripture one more time. Keep that in your heart. Keep that in your mind. Okay, in the next slide, I'm going to define for you uh, the, the, the scripture. Deuteronomy 5 is on your, your paper. The next question is, what is a heritage? The intentional passing of a godly heritage is defined this way. A heritage is defined as the social, emotional, and spiritual legacy passed from parent to child, good or bad. That's what a heritage is. It's the social, emotional, and spiritual legacy that has been passed to you. Parent to child. And you all have one. And you all are passing one to the next generation. Even if you don't have any children, you're passing a heritage that you've got to the next generation. And somebody said to me one time, they raised their hand in question, so where'd you get that? You say a social, emotional, and spiritual legacy Pass. Show me in the Bible where that is. We found that, I found that in Luke 2.52, where it says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. Okay, he, he, he grew in favor with God, that's the spiritual component. He grew in favor with man, that's the social component. He, he grew in wisdom and stature, that's physically and psychologically. Everything that happens to you physically and psychologically is registered in the emotions, and we just call it the emotion. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So, the emotional, the social, and the spiritual legacy passed from parent to child, good or bad. Every heritage has three distinct, uh, uh, three distinct uh, components. And here they are. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The spiritual, the emotional, and the social. It's so important to, for you to understand. When you take these evaluations, you'll take a spiritual evaluation, you'll take an emo, uh, emotional evaluation, and you'll take a, a social evaluation. And you will see those three will have different numbers. You may, you may have a good spiritual and a good social uh, heritage, but you may lack in the emotional. Or you may have good emotional and social and lack in the spiritual. Or usually one is stronger than the other, and the, and the, other are, the others are weaker. And what you want is you, is you want to get all three of them very strong, and you want to pass a strong spiritual heritage, you want to pass a strong emotional heritage, and a sp strong social heritage. And so, let that soak in just a little bit. Mm. That's what you're passing. And we're going to drill down on those and identify those. So in the next slide, then I want to uh, give you what uh, a spiritual legacy. It's the bottom of the page. Uh, the definition of a spiritual legacy is this. It is a process whereby parents model and reinforce the unseen realities of the spiritual life. What is, my spirit, what is a spiritual legacy, we say? Well... It's a process, and I say this to parents, and, 
and oh, thank goodness it is a process. Because there are times when we think we have failed. And we see our kids have doing something and we don't like it and it's like, how did you learn that? Where did you learn that? And remember, this, isn't a pro- this is a process. You have 18 years to calm that savage beast. You have 18 years before you turn them loose on society to, to tame, their, tame their heart. It's a process where you model. You remember what Deuteronomy 6 said? First, it is to be on your hearts. You can't give what's not in your heart. So it's, it's to be in your heart. You model it, and then you reinforce it. And how you do that? With those four things. By verbalizing, by symbolizing, by visualizing, and by journalizing. You model and reinforce the unseen realities of the spiritual life. Unseen realities. What, what is an unseen reality? Anybody have any idea? What, what is an unseen reality? The power of God is an unseen reality. What is? Conscience. It's an unseen reality. Hope is an unseen reality. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And disappointment. Yes, that's all right. Those are all unseen realities. And the, the spiritual legacy takes care of the unseen realities. In, in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, God points out through the Apostle Paul that the things you can see are, are temporary. And the things you cannot see are eternal. The unseen realities are eternal. Any unseen, uh, anything that's going to be eternal in their life, their soul, that's where the spiritual legacy comes in. And there are people that will take the spiritual totally out in a secularized society. They'll take the spiritual totally out and they'll say, I don't need that part of the legacy. Not knowing that that that's a death knell to that child. They need spiritual legacy, a strong spiritual legacy as much as they they need anything. And let me me identify what a spiritual legacy is. In the next slide, you'll uh, you'll see. A spiritual legacy is not church attendance. And I'm not here to tell you not to come to church. Church attendance is important, but that's not what a spiritual legacy is. I've had parents say, I took my kids to church, I took them every Sunday, and let me tell you what they did. You know what my kid did? I took them every Sunday. I read the Bible to them. Spiritual legacy is not Bible reading, although that's really important, but it is not that. And a spiritual legacy is not formal religious instruction. I sent my kid to a Christian school. I homeschooled my kid. I did this, and let me tell you what they did. It's not what a spiritual legacy is. We think that we think it is, but it is not. Um, in the next slide, what you'll see is uh, uh, what a spiritual legacy is. It's more what we do than what we say. It's more what we do than what we say. And ag- again, it's a process, not an event. Your child's going to have some horrible times. Don't worry about it. They'll get over it. That's just an event. Part of, it's part of the process. It's modeled and reinforced, not mandated. Well, we could sit and talk on that. You know, if we had time, I would, I would ask you to get in a small group and knee to knee and shoulder to shoulder talk about what do you mean it's modeled and reinforced, not mandated. We try to mandate spirituality and it doesn't work. It won't work. As a matter, in fact, it will drive them away. It's modeled and it's reinforced. We're going to show you how to do that. And it prepares our children to recognize the unseen realities of a spiritual life. That's what that legacy is. Now, um, some parental errors that parents have is this. Now, if if, if this is up there and you've done this, I didn't know that and your pastor didn't tell me about it. But this is what parents do. You know what we, we, we say? Well, I'll let my kid decide for themselves when they're older. <laughs> I will let my kids decide for themselves. Do, do you do that 
uh, with their teeth? Do, do you say, well, my kid doesn't like to brush his teeth. So when he gets older, I'm going to let him decide if he wants to do that or not. No. My kid needs an education. But they don't like school. So I'm just going to, uh, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm going to let them stay home. When they get old enough, they think they need something, they'll go to college. They'll do something. They wouldn't get into college. We don't do that. The only place we do that is in the spiritual component in the legacy. I don't want to force religion down the throat of my child. And so I'm not going to make them. You make them do everything else. And the most important thing in their life, we use this excuse. Unbelievable to me. I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know, I didn't go to church when I was small. I don't want to be a hypocrite. The same thing could be true. When you were small and your parents cooked things you didn't want to eat, is it a hypocrite to make your kids eat that healthy food? Are you being a hypocrite for that? Are you being a hypocrite to make them brush their teeth and go to school? No, it's only in the spiritual component that we think that's hypocritical. I hate all that church stuff growing up, so I'm not going to force it on my kids. I've heard that so much. I hate all that church stuff. I, I, I used to tell the people, I'm part of the drug culture. I was drugged to church on Sunday morning, and I was drugged to church on Sunday night, and I was j- drugged to church on Wednesday night, and Thursday night, and Saturday. But boy, did it pay off. That dragged me to church, did it pay off. So, I want this next slide to sort of burn in your mind. And it's not, it's not on your uh, list here. It is uh, the, after the parental errors, the three windows of opportunity. Here they are. The three windows are the imprint period, the impression period, and the game phase, coaching phase. And I want to spend a little time here because you're going to see this uh, again. And if, if, if I would have had this when, when my kids were growing up, I wish I would have had this. Uh, because it would have helped me understand. You see, the, the, the vertical line on the far left is the receptivity line. That's the receptivity to your values. That's the level of receptivity to your values. The horizontal line at the bottom is the age of the child. And you see two ages. There's age 7 and there's age 15. Those are transitional stages in the, in the life of a child and in the life of a parent. So let that burn in your mind. Around the age of seven, there's going to be a transition period. Around the age of 15, there's going to be a a transition period. Now, the first window of opportunity, we call it the imprint period. The second window of opportunity, we call it the impression period. And the third window, it's the game phase or the coaching phase. And I want to explain those. And I want to show you how this works. The imprint period from zero to seven is a stage where a child does not have the power to reason. They can't reason. They don't have the ability to reason. They can't reason out a a, a math project. They can't reason out why this is right and why this is wrong. It's only by your word that they know what is right and what is wrong. And they will believe anything you say during that period of time. If you tell them a dog is a cow and a cow is a dog, they'll believe it. And they'll go to preschool and tell people that that, uh, that that great big thing with udders out there, that brown and white thing, that's a dog. Because my daddy said it was. They believe anything. It's, it's the imprint period. They don't have the power to reason. And it's, a, it's really a fun stage. I just had all kind of fun with my kids, you know. You, you'd pass a, you'd, you'd pass a, a tomato uh, farm or ranch or raising tomatoes, and you've got those stakes in the ground, you know, where those vines grow up on them. And my son would say, well, Dad, what is that? I said, well, that's where they grow sticks. That's how you get sticks. Oh, that makes sense. You know, that's the sticks. That's where we get sticks. They grow them. Uh, one, of, one of my little grandkids, uh, they passed a, a uh, big smokestacks, this uh, big uh, cement factory smokestacks, and the smoke was coming out. And he said, so that's where they get clouds. That's a, they believe anything you tell them. That is a great time to imprint on them. Now, James Dobson, focus on the family, he had an illustration here 
and it was the illustration of the goose and the gosling. If, if you take a, a mother goose who's uh, in the nest, she's laying, laying the eggs, and she's uh, getting ready to incubate those, those eggs. When those eggs hatch, she gets up. There's a critical period of time where those goslings imprint on that mother goose. And she will get up out of the nest, and she will head for the water that should be a danger to them. And what happens? You'll see all those goslings in a row. Because they've imprinted on the mom, they'll go right with her, right into the water. Wherever she goes, they go. I know you've seen it. We've got all kinds of them around where we are. They'll walk right across the road. You know, all the cars are stopped. There's a beautiful little sight, and all those goslings right behind. That's just the way they do, the way they work. Mother Goose. And they wondered if that, that imprint period was that real, and they wondered if it was true. So they, they took uh, goose eggs and <clears throat> put them in an incubator, and they put a, a soccer ball, a football, in the nest with them instead of a mother goose. They put a soccer ball in. And when those eggs hatched, that critical period of time where they imprinted, they took the soccer ball and they set it down all those little goslings and they kicked it. And those goslings followed that soccer ball. Just the way they would follow the mother goose. Whatever was in the nest is what they imprinted on. And his conclusion was, who is in the nest at this period of time, the age of your child, that they will follow? Because there's a critical period of time in our, in our human where that kid is imprinting on the parent. And whatever that parent does, that child will follow. They'll believe what you believe in that period. In America, in, in, in the United States, we tend to warehouse our children in preschool. And instead of the parents imprinting on the children, it is the children, I mean, instead of the children imprinting on the parents, they're imprinting on somebody you trust, that you pay to do this. And it hurts my heart. You know, we have a preschool. There's probably 150 kids in that preschool where we are. But we do it because it's a place where people know it's safe and they'll be taught the scriptures and all of that because if you take them somewhere else, who knows what they'll be taught. But that age is so important, so important. Around the age of seven, your child will begin, you'll begin to see, they'll ask why, 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 why? And they're asking why because they're beginning this power of reasoning. And uh, <clears throat> they'll start to be able to reason. We call it the impression period because that's where you can impress these on your children. You impress your values on them. Look at, look at the bell curve. It, it goes up and it rises around the age of 9, 10, 11, 12. That's that curve, the age of that curve, 9, 10, 11, 12. Remember, at the age of 9, their moral compass is already set. By the time they reach 13, they'll die believing what they believe. And you see what happens? That goes up and it starts back down. The level of receptivity is going down. And at around the age of 15, they come to another transition. At that transition, they're going to take the values that you taught them and they're going to take them and test them against real-life situations to see if they work. And if they don't work, they'll find somebody else's values and they will adopt those. And you want them to adopt yours. And in the imprint period, you're a parent. In the impression period, you're a parent, but when you get into the game phase, you're no longer, they don't need a parent any longer. You've already taught them all the rules. You've already taught them how this house runs. You've already taught them everything. Now they need a coach. They need a coach to say, that's not the way I taught you. It's not how we play the game. If you've ever coached basketball, you ever coached soccer, you ever coached baseball, whatever game you coach, you know that the coach can't play the game. That the coach is on the sideline. And what does he do? After you've run those plays and you've, you've taught them everything on how to defeat that team, when they do it wrong, you call a timeout, you call them to the bench. Okay, that's not the way we, not the way we practice that. Not the way we play that. Now get back in the game. Let's make an adjustment. Get back in the game. And that's what we do. That's the, you, you're, they're in the game phase of life. You're in the coaching phase. If you try to parent a child 
in that game phase, the way you parented them in the impression period, you're going to get rebellion. Big time rebellion. If you try to, if you try to parent a, a, a child in the impression window, the way you parent them in the imprint window, you're going to get a frustrated child. Mama knows all. Now they don't reason with me. Now I can't find out why. They just tell me what to do. Well, why, why, why am I doing this? Why are we doing this? Because I said so. Okay. I'll find somebody who will tell me. That's, that's what they say. I'll find, and they do. They'll find a, a professor. They'll find a high school teacher. They'll find a, 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 a parents of a friend. And they'll hang out. They'll even, we, we have what they call mall rats. They'll go to the mall. And they'll just go around the mall. You know what they do? They get their theology. They get it from movies. They get it from books. They get it from, well, if they do it there, they get it from TV. They, your values has, haven't worked. And so I've got to find another place where I can get it. And so these three areas are important. And I'm going to show you some things a little bit later on this window that will help you understand. Now, you see that 33%? We talked about that a little bit earlier. That 33% there is the highest level of receptivity aggregate across the nation. The highest percentage that you'll get to pass your children. You have a one-third chance for them to get your values. One-third chance. 33% possi probability. That's, now, that's not just in the Christian community. That's in the aggregate across all, Christians and non-Christians. But you know, the New York Times came out with an article not long ago that 81% of parents, 81% want their child to get good I can't imagine what the 19% want. The other 19%. But 81% want their child to have their values. And they're trying to pass their values on. And uh, uh, it's not working too well for them. So that's an, that's an important one. Now, let me stop and, and uh, you, you have any questions? I've, I've talked for an hour now. Uh, do, do you have any questions up to now about what, what's been said? I'm setting the stage for you. I'm, I'm talking about the why. Any questions come to your mind yet? I, I don't want to go on if you have them. Yeah. That's a really good question. We looked at that. They... <clears throat> I, I, I said when I said 70%, some believe it's higher. And I've seen it as high as in the 90%. They say the 70% are the ones that stay gone. Stay gone. It's at 90%, tw you know, 20% of them will come back. But 70, uh, the 70% will, will stay gone. But I don't, I, I don't, you know, you can force them to read a Bible, but what have you done if you force them? Um, you, you've got the Word of God in their heart, but they begin to hate the Bible because it's the, it's, it's part of punishment. You know, if you don't, if you don't act right, then you're going to have to read your Bible. And if you don't act right, you, you got to go to church. And, and then um, when we say we don't force, that's not the major thing that you would do. Force would be the last thing that you would do. But you may have to force them to go to church. You may have to force them. But if you, if you go to church, you get up from the time they're young and you're dressed on Sunday, it's not a matter of are we going to church, it's what's I'm, what am I going to wear? That would be the question. What am I going to wear? So you've modeled it and you've reinforced it that way through your model and the child just it gets in there and that's what they do. 
it becomes a habit that they do too. But but that's a that's a really good question uh, that you ask. But modeling and them following um, there's there's a uh, there's a percentage out and I uh, I can cite it for you if you want it. I'll find it later. I can't. S- the citation is not in my head. But when a mom comes to Christ um, in the family and the father doesn't, when the mom comes to Christ, then there's a 15% chance that the rest of the family will follow when mom does. When dad comes to Christ and goes to church, in fact, it's 95% will follow. You see how that comes up? And it, it says that in the Bible where it said uh, the, the Philippian jailer and when he came to Christ and his whole house. And his whole house. So the model is for dad to be involved, not in Latin America, like you're going to church. Wife, be sure you take the kids to church because that's important. And that's what they were fighting there. Um, uh, modeling is the best way. It's the best way. But when we never did have to make our kids go to church. Uh, we, we, ne- we never did. Uh, but yes, yes, go ahead. What about the decision to get baptized? Should we encourage them to do it earlier when they're already, you know, if they've been going to church all their life and maybe 12 or 13, they believe? Um, should we just, help, you know, encourage them to get baptized since you believe, or... That's a, that's a good question, too. Um, and uh, I'm going to cover that uh, a little bit later. You're going um, to see on this chart where those milestones will come in. But to answer your question is, Jesus said, you suffer the little children to come unto me. You allow them to come. Don't hinder them. And if they want to, now, one of the things that we have in our church, I say most churches, uh, they have the church, uh, the family in the support role of the church. They're building their church on the back of the family. And they, they've got the family in the support role of the church, and I believe that's wrong. I believe that's a wrong way to build a church. You flip that. You put the church in the support role of the family. And then the church resources the family. The church uh, supports the family. And, and uh, we say at our church, it is taught in the home and it's celebrated in the church. It should be first taught in the home and then you celebrate. Baptism should be taught in the home and it should be celebrated in the church. Well, but one of the ways that we help the parent with that, we, on Wednesday night, we, you have Awanas here. We have what's called the KSG, Kids Small Group. And in Kids Small Group, uh, in preschool, uh, when they start, it's, it's pre-preschool, they learn the Old Testament characters, Daniel in the lion's den, you know, Joseph thrown into the pit and sold by his brothers. All of those stories you learn, you learn all of those up to the second grade. And uh, it's a whole curriculum where you, where you learn the Old Testament, really. When they go into the third grade, they start the New Testament. We call it 101, uh, 201, 301, 401. And 101 is... Uh, is uh, uh, well, it's a new it's a new testament all the way through. In it, we teach baptism, and we teach communion. And when that happens, I go in and I teach that to the that those small groups. They meet together. And we talk about baptism. We talk about communion. And I'll tell you, when I go in there with those kids, when I start teaching on baptism, they can teach me because they already know what baptism is. Uh, that teacher has done such a good job. And I go in, then I just sit with them, reinforce it. And, uh, and w- we say to the parent, you, you need to decide of the, the spiritual knowledge of that child, the social st- standing of that child. Are they too young? Then there's another line of where they meet with a pastor and the pastor talks to them. And if a parent is just overexcited about it and that child doesn't know what sin is, doesn't think they've ever sinned, well, they re- you, you, you want to wait on that child. And, and we encourage them to wait. But when that child knows what baptism is, we, would not, we wouldn't keep them from it. And our baptism is, is much different, and I want to talk about that at our church. This, this, I, I feel so at home here because this church, this feels like our first auditorium. Uh, 
or wh- where we were. I mean, it was so intimate. And then when we grew and we had two services and three services, and we just said, well, we can't do this anymore, and we built a big, a bigger one, we lost all that intimacy, and I hated that. And, but it is what it is, and, you know. So I, I love, I love this, this look here. But w- we have a baptistry, a supportable baptistry. Ho- hold that thought. I want you to talk. A portable baptistry, and it, and it, it sit over here. And uh, when that child is baptized, or when that adult is baptized, uh, up in the crow's nest, they have video, and it, and the cameras are down on it, so everybody can watch the baptism on the big screen. Okay. But around that baptistry are the parents, are all family, are everybody that's had anything to do with the growth of that child, to impact that child. They come around that baptistry, sometimes three and four deep. You can't see it from the auditorium. You have to look at the screen. Because we believe if you celebrate it, you add value to it. And so we think that should be celebrated at that time. So we're sure, we're pretty sure every child knows what they're doing when they get there. Uh, we teach it really strong. But I, I, we believe they should be. You, you had something to add? That is the key, that imprint period. Yeah, that's good. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, just as a follow-up question, um, I came to know the Lord when I was four, uh, next to the bed with my mom. Uh, I accepted Jesus, but to be honest, um, I would say it wasn't truly from my heart. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Um, my that son's eight now, and my desire is that it would be from his heart, and I just don't want him to pray for a decision. In fact, I've debated and argued with my wife as to whether or not we should lead him in a sinner's prayer and I'm so against it right now because I want it to be true from his heart how do we know is there I I just don't want a decision because my brother is not walking with the Lord right now we had similar paths and even in my faith I'm struggling and I you know this whole thing of spiritual legacy I'm looking at the sheet I'm going okay yes my parents give me a spiritual legacy and everything you said that it's not is what my parents tried to do was was that so how do I avoid bringing that down towards my son. I know you're probably going to cover that, but... Yeah, uh, we, we, we will cover it, but that is a really good question. At the age of four, you still don't have the power to reason. And I... Uh, so you can't reason your sin. You can't reason. And a child would not... If they can't reason, they w- they're not ready. Um, a lot of kids want to be baptized because their friends are being baptized. And uh, because a friend says, I'm, I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven. And they don't understand what baptism is. And we really take pains uh, for that not to happen. And we have, we've had people come in and sit down with us, with the pastor, and they come out and say, no, the child's not ready. We, we recommend against it. And I think, you're, I think you're in a good phase now. Don't force that child. Jesus said, allow them to come to me. Don't force them over to me. Allow them to come to me. If they want to come to them, and we tell our children and some of our grandchildren now are going through this very thing whether to get saved or not that sort of thing we we say put them off as much as you can until they won't be put off and uh when they when they won't be put off then you know they've reasoned it and uh and and it'll be a different age for er for everybody what you have to understand is god is not waiting in heaven for your child to get right to the age of accountability 
where they'll call on him and he go, then he's going to zap them. You're almost there where you're going to call on me. Gotcha. You're not going to call on me. You should have done it earlier. No, he's not that kind of a God. He said, you let them come to me. And I think that's what you're doing. You're allowing them to come. Don't force it on them. You're allowing them to come. Ask them the right question. The best question to ask, and, and by the way, we have, we, Gail wrote, um, she taught in college uh, child growth and development in, in a Bible college. And one of the things she wrote was how to lead your child to Christ. And that's in the back of every one of our books. And it tells you the questions to ask, what words not to say to them, what words to say to them, how to find out if you, if when they talk to you, if they're really sincere. And if they're sincere, then you let them come. But that's, that's, that's a very good question. Yes. See, this is, this is why we needed to take time. I knew you had questions and you're just sitting there staring at me. Yes, ma'am. This graph goes, I, I, I can clearly see my own child's difference at seven years old and 15 years old. Uh, I'm wondering if there's another change at a later stage, like from a teenage years to an adult, and how would that inf impact uh, it, your relationship with your child in terms of your windows of opportunity? Or maybe it's not windows of opportunity, but like just your influence to them on spiritual things. Um, and, and that is a concern, and, and it's ongoing for us. We, we have a large family now. We see... We see it all. You know, we've got all ages. Our oldest granddaughter's 20. Next month she'll be 20, and our youngest is seven, seven months. So we see all of this playing out at our dinner table every Sunday morning. You know, and you can just see all of this right here. You can see it all working. And you can see the parents who've got kids moving from impression to game phase, and they're in that. Now they're trying to coach instead of parent. You know, because, no, that's not the way we taught it. You know, now that's, this is the way that it's played. We, we see it all. But what happens is, what you're going to find out is the relationship, when you become their coach, you want to be the best coach they ever had. You want to be the best coach they, they could ever have in life, life coach. You get to do that. And because you love them more than any coach could ever love them, you will, you will coach them right. And we do, we have an entire section on um, coaching your 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 team through through the game phase, but that's another uh, four week, five week. I mean, it's just it, it, there's so much there's so much in it. But you get them through the imprint period, the impression period, and you get them in the game phase, the coaching phase. You're that's where you're going to enjoy it. Now you've taught them everything, and it actually, yeah, you enjoy that now. They're going to frustrate you. They're going to frustrate. In fact, we've had times when she hit heads with our old, uh, oldest daughter. They, they, they locked horns on some small issue. And, you know, they get stubborn. I mean, they're, they're becoming adults. She's walking out of the kitchen while I'm walking into the kitchen, and she says to me in passing, quite, very quietly, you, you, you better do something or I will kill her. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got that, you know. But one day, Proverbs 30 will come, and they will call you blessed. They'll rise up and call you blessed. But uh, you stay with them. Proverbs 30 will happen. They will rise up and call you blessed. And I remember the time where her and, and uh, Becky, and by the way, my Becky now is one of the most wise people I know, that my children are my heroes. Um, she, she, the wisdom she has, just incredible. But we, we didn't think that. There were times we didn't think that. But you, you're the coach. They're, the, they're playing the game. You're the coach. They're not playing the game right. Just call a timeout and call them aside. And I'm going to show you how to do that. I've got an entire book on, on milestones in the child's life, and I'm making it available to you. you. In fact, I called my son today, and we took the price way down to a $1.99 or a $15 book. And you can, you can go online and walk, if you want it, you get it. It's not a book that you will curl out by the fireside and you'll read it, but it will take you phase by phase through this on every milestone. 
And the church in family ministry needs to recognize those milestones and then help celebrate it in the church on all those milestones. And uh, that child comes to the church, and so you're tying them to, to the church, the body of Christ, through these milestones, and they stick because they've, they've, uh, that celebration has added value to it. And we'll see that again on, on some of this. And I hope some of these questions will be, will, will be answered uh, uh, when we get through it. Okay. All right. So what what I want to do now is uh, I want to end, and we, we have 30 minutes. And I don't know if we can do this in 30 minutes, but we're not going to rush it because this is a why this, this really needs to happen. But I want to go into every legacy, spiritual and emotional and the social legacy, and I want you to see them. Now, you know, have you ever heard of the leading economic indicators? In our country, we've got leading economic indicators, and everybody looks to those leading economic. There's the leading cultural indicators that you look at the culture, where's the culture going? Well, we figured, well, shoot, we should have leading legacy indicators. So we developed these spiritual legacies, and what you'll see here, this is what a strong spiritual legacy looks like. And you say, uh, uh, you probably asked that question when, um, when I started talking about spiritual legacy. Here's what it looks like. A strong legacy acknowledges and reinforces spiritual reality in the home. All of this is in the home. A strong legacy views God as a personal, caring being who is to be both loved and respected. And they see that through your life. It makes spiritual activities a routine part of life. You know, I know of families where if they do anything spiritual, it is as awkward. It's so awkward the kids don't even, they're embarrassed. It's so awkward. It should be routine in your home. And it, you can't take them to church and it be routine. And church won't teach them the routine. You learn routine in the home. <coughs> Make spiritual activities. What are those spiritual activities? We're going to talk about what spir those spiritual activities are. But they're a routine part of life. You talk about spiritual issues as a means of reinforcing spiritual commitments. They will ask you spiritual issues. And a lot of dads and moms, because they don't think they know the answer, won't answer. Uh, ask the, we'll ask the pastor. Uh, we'll, we'll ask the Sunday school teacher. Well, the Sunday school teacher and pastor may be having their own issues with their kids, trying to get them. You know, it's your job. It's not my job to raise the kids in that church. It's the parents' job. You know, God has a great, he has a great plan. He has two Sunday school teachers for every child. And their names are mom and dad. That's, that's, that's who should be teaching them. Talk about spiritual issues as a means of reinforcing spiritual commitment. Clarify timeless truth. Right from wrong. What is right and what is wrong? Well, how do you get that? From the Bible. Not your opinion. From the Bible. It incorporates spiritual principles into everyday living. Why do we do this? Why do we go to school? Why do we brush our teeth? Why do we eat meals together? Why do we do that? It'd be a spiritual principle. Okay, then you have the weak indicators. Here's what a weak legacy, spiritual legacy looks like. It undermines or it ignores spiritual reality. Oh, homes, it's unbelievable. It views God as an impersonal being to be ignored or feared and not in awe, but afraid. Boy, if we don't do that, God's going to send a lightning bolt down and get us. It never or it rarely participates in spiritual activity. And it has few spiritual discussions of a constructive nature. 
and it confuses absolutes and it upholds relativism. And it separates the spiritual from the practical. Have you ever heard the term secular and sacred? Do you have that term in Chinese uh, or in Taiwanese? Secular and sacred? Well, that's the secular part. This is the sacred part. To a believer, there is no such thing. Everything you do, and everything you do, do it to the glory of God. I think that's what the Bible says. I think. There is no, there is no separation from the spiritual and the, from the practical. Now, everybody's got a pencil. The next page, what you're going to see is a spiritual legacy evaluation. And I want to explain this to you. And I'd like, for, I'd like for everybody to take it. Now, this is not scientific. Uh, so we're not, we're not uh, doing anything to uh, psycho psychologically or all that. It just is, is it gives an indication of what, how you perceived what your parents gave to you. Okay, follow me here now. How did you perceive what your parents gave to you? The legacy they were, the heritage they were giving you, how did you perceive it? And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to answer this because it's like dissing my parents. It's not dissing your parents. Your parents tried to do it right. I think pastor said at the very beginning, we want to do the very best job we possibly can. Okay, the pastor said. So the spiritual legacy evaluation Answer it quickly. I'm only, I'm only giving you a minute to do this when we start. Now, don't start yet. Don't start yet. Uh, because it, 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 you'll, you'll mess things up. Answer by circling the number that best reflects the legacy you received from your parents. How you received it. You received it through your own sinfulness. It may not be what they intended, but that's what you received. Okay? All right? How you received it. And uh, circle it, and when you come down, then there's results. So I'm going to look at my watch here, and I'm going to give you a minute. And so are you ready? Okay, everybody got their pencils? Okay, five, four, three, two, okay, go. Okay, 20 seconds. Okay, everybody done? Now at the bottom, let me ask you, uh, don't be embarrassed. I mean... Uh, we, we just want to see where we are on the spiritual legacy. And remember, one of them may be weak. Possible one of your, or two may be, or all three may be weak. I've been in a church when, <laughs> down in Wasco, California, where the pastor was the weakest spiritual legacy. And, and all the people were saying, hey, you're the pastor? Well, the thing was, he overcame what was passed to him. And that's what you, that's what you want to do, is you want to overcome it. Now, did anybody score below a 10 on spiritual legacy? Anybody? Okay. You, you, usually there, there, are, there are some 10 to 13 weak spiritual legacy. Okay. Very good. 14 to 18 mixed between good and bad. 
you know, it's about equally divided. 19 to 24, a healthy legacy. Anybody score above 24? Anybody above 24? Okay, uh, what I want to say to you is uh, that are, they're there to whom much is given, much is required. <laughs> to whom much is given, much is, isn't that, that's great. Now, what you see is you see the strength. Now, if you scored in the upper half of this self-analysis, you're blessed. That's what, you're, what, that's what it says on your outline there. You're blessed by an outstanding spiritual heritage. Those who receive such a legacy, they're, they're rare. If your score ended up near the bottom, don't despair. There are many who have established and passed a wonderful heritage despite falling into this category. Some, most of us will fall somewhere in between. And as stated earlier, more likely than not, we receive the mixed bag. Now, take the, put this in front of you. And you say, okay, so how do I improve a spiritual heritage? How do I improve it? Well, if you look at the first one, the first one is the worst. Number one, never. Look at how it exponentially comes down. Oh, it's rare. Not never, it's rare. Oh, sometimes. And then frequently. And then almost always. And then consistently. What you want to do is work your way down that to get to the top one. If, if the spiritual legacy is in your home, just put this up somewhere, and on all these questions that your kids will one day answer, move, move to six. Move all the way down exponentially to six. You see how that works? That works on all of these evaluations that you have. Move them, move them, little at a time. Little at a time until you get to the top. Now, now that's important. Now, here's a, here's a slide. This is uh, barriers to being intentional about passing on a spiritual heritage. And that word intentional um, is, a, is a word that wasn't used very much when we started writing. We wrote, these, we wrote this material in the late 90s, and intentionality wasn't used that much. It's, it's used more and more today. But uh, what, how we came up with that word was uh, the publisher who was publishing our book, Moody, Moody Press published the book, um, they told us... Uh, uh, give us, in 500 words, give us what this book is about. So we wrote, uh, m uh, my co-author and I, we wrote 500 words and said, this is what the book is about. They came back and said, okay, in 100 words, write and tell us what the book is about. So we wrote 100 words, little paragraphs. And when we got done with that, they came back and said, okay, tell us in 25 words what this book is about. So we wrote 25 words. And then they said, tell us what this book about is in one sentence. So we gave them one sentence. And then they said, tell us what this book about is about in one word. Intentionality. In be intentional. Intentionality. The sentence that we wrote was how to be intentional about the legacy you leave. That's the sentence. That's what that entire book is about. How to be intentional about the legacy you leave. Be intentional. Do something. Don't parent by accident. Well, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. You know what I mean? <clears throat> but you don't want it to run your day. You can't use it. It's, it's useless except for those two times during the day. Be intentional. about what you're doing. Intentionality. And the reason they're not intentional, some are biblically illiterate. Um, they just don't know the Bible. And, us, I, and I want to say something. I'm going to reveal something to you ladies that you probably don't know. Us guys, we have egos. And some of them are bigger than Taipei. You know what I mean? And we don't, we don't, we don't want to get up in front of our family and fail. And so, if we don't know the Bible very well, chances are we're not going to do it. So we're biblically illiterate. We've got to take care of that. 
we abdicate the responsibility to the church. I took my kids to church. The church should have taught them. We abdicate the responsibility. There's no role models or mentors. And there's no urgency. Eh, right now I'm working on my portfolio. I'm working on my retirement. I'm working on this. I'm working on that. Uh, when they get older, I'll, I'll get involved. And you've missed the imprint period. And you've missed the impression period. And you wonder why your kids won't respond to you. I, I was speaking at, at Big Bear at a men's retreat. And I had a guy, we, after we talked about this, a guy came, he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Pastor Otis, can you, can you just tell me how to do it right when I've done it all wrong? How do you answer that? How do you answer that? How can we do it right when you've done it all wrong? Now, <coughs> we're going to go to the, uh, the emotional. Um, let's see what I've got here. No, it's yeah, let's do this one. I want you to read this with me out loud. Um, after the spiritual legacy, I, I, I want to be sure that we understand everything we're doing here is uh, out of the Bible. It's Psalm 78, verse 5 through 7. Okay, read it with me out loud. Okay, begin. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children, and then they would put their trust in God. That's what passing a heritage is, right there. That's it. Um, hmm, I got these two backwards. So would you, yeah, go to the emotional legacy. Here's what the emotional legacy looks like. It's an enduring sense of security and stability nurtured in an environment of safety and love. That pretty much says, now the key word in that, you can't see it very well, it's in bold, is the word in. It's an enduring sense of security and stability nurtured in, not nurtured by. Nurtured in an environment of safety and love. Inside. Now if you go back now to that one before. We say the emotional legacy is like the stabilizer bar in a, in a car. The guys will understand that in a race car. They have a stabilizer bar. And when they hit the curves on that, on that oval track, when they hit those curves, that stabilizer bar keeps the wheels on the asphalt so they can get traction. So then they get good traction. And they don't, if wheels come off of the asphalt, they go into the wall. That emotional keeps the, the rubber to the road, basically. What happens is, sometimes even our kids, there's emotional cocooning. They wrap their emotions in a tight cocoon of protection around themselves, shutting everyone else out, keeping them at arm's length. And so if the stabilizer bar, the emotional legacy is broken, then how do you take care of that? And this is how you do it. You recognize and divert the pain. And you repair the damage. And you give your child a place of rest not rescue. We have a tendency to want to rescue them. But you can't do that. I'm going to pass something out to you now and uh, that will help you understand this repairing the stabilizer bar. There, it, it's a uh, very simple. It's, it's just a three-fold cord. We talked about the three-fold cord at the very beginning. These are uh, nothing more than yarn. And what I, what I want you to do is when you hold it up, there's a blue one, and there's a gold one, and there's a red one. The red one, we say, represents our spiritual legacy, 
you can figure that out, what red means. The blood of Christ. The gold one represents our social legacy. You know, gold, money, the, the golden rule. He who has the gold will make the rule. <laughs> they say, but that's not really the golden rule. But anyway, that's the way it goes. And the, the blue one is the emotional component. You know, I'm blue. I'm, I feel down. I'm blue. If you take just the, uh, the blue one, let's just take the blue one. If you just take the blue one and you isolate the gold and the red one and you hang a very heavy thing on that blue one, let's say you hang a brick, a 10-pound brick, that string is going to break because it can't take the weight. Alexander White says, we humans tend to hang very heavy things on very thin wires. Have you ever heard somebody say, that person just snapped? I don't know how you would say it in, in this language, but that person, the weight just got too heavy, they just snapped. Why'd they do that? Well, it's like they just snapped. They hung something very heavy on one strand of that legacy, and it didn't work. I ask you to braid that. Now, ladies, you're going to have may have to teach your husband how to braid that. But if you braid those three, you strengthen that cord more than just triple. What 10 pounds would break, now you would think 30 pounds would break it if you had three together. But it can hold as much as 50 pounds because it's all woven together that cord of three strands Solomon said is not quickly broken not quickly broken and so you wrap these legacies together and you get strength in it let me give you an illustration of it I think everybody in the world knows about 9-11 when the planes flew into the towers in New York City that was a hit that our nation took. And I want to show you what happened. When that happened, our leaders went to the Capitol steps and called for a prayer. A spiritual component. Pray for the people. Pray for our country. The emotional toll that it took was incredible. You could see that in the people who were running from that. The emotion of our country was deep and deep. And the social component, people jumped in their cars without a change of clothes, without anything. They just went to do whatever they could to help. All three of those components worked in our nation. The spiritual, the emotional, and the social. You saw it. That's what it took for it to heal. Those three things. Now that happens in a microcosm in families on a daily, if not a weekly, if not daily. So how do you handle when you take a hit, emotional hit? How do you handle it? Well, if you take an emotional hit, one of the things you want to do is your spiritual legacy will give you the greater good for the suffering that you're going through. Why do people suffer? A spiritual legacy will help you understand that. And then the social legacy, everybody comes around to support and to build you up. There's and, and you know, they don't even have to say anything. Just them being there says it all. That's the social. So all of that woven together strengthens that legacy that you're passing to your children. And you teach them how to do that. So there is a, there is a, uh, uh, now if we go to the strong legacy indicators, here it is again. And the, this is about all we have. We'll pick up the social in the morning and, and, and keep moving. These strong legacy indicators, it provides a safe environment in which deep emotional roots can grow. That's what your home should do. Provide a safe environment for that child. They get, at school, they get made fun of. 
Uh, they take an emotional hit when they come home. It ought to be safe. Safe environment where those deep emotional roots can grow. It fosters confidence through stability. It conveys a tone of trusting support. It nurtures a strong sense of positive identity. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow in tradition. It creates a resting place for the soul. Do you know the most emotional um, invitation that we'd ever get was Jesus when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you he didn't say, I will rescue you. He said, I'll give you rest. It's a place of rest so that you can heal. That's what the home should be. And it demonstrates unconditional love. And we're going to talk about that. A weak legacy indicators of emo emotions is that it breeds insecurity and shallow emotional development. It fosters fearfulness through instability. And it conveys a tone of mistrust, criticism, and, or worse, apathy. I just don't care. It undermines a healthy sense of personal worth. And it causes inward turmoil. And communicates that a person just does not measure up. Wish you could be like your brother. Why can't you be like your sister? You know, that sort of thing. Emotional legacy indicator. Okay, and so there's, there's another, uh, on, on that uh, next page, there's another evaluation. And we've got time to take it, and then we'll be done for tonight. And I will, I will I'd like to give you some instruction of what we're going to do tomorrow. Okay, you have the emotional legacy evaluation in front of you. Well, you know what to do. So you have one minute. All done? So let me ask you, <clears throat> anybody score below a 10 on the emotional legacy? Okay. Hmm? About 10 to 13, a weak emo emotional legacy. Okay. 14 to 18, mixed good and bad elements. Oh, nobody in the middle? 19 to 24, healthy. And then above 24, strong. Very good. Very good. You know, I don't think I've ever been in a group that nobody got between 14 and 18 because that's usually the median. So you guys are biblical. You're either hot or cold.
Uh, like I said, don't despair. If you have a low score, don't despair. And then you can move this up by exponentially in your home, moving from one to six, and ma making sure your home is there. And the social legacy, is, that's where we'll pick up tomorrow. But I have about two minutes, and I, I, I want to show you something in your... Uh, I gave you a handout called Warrior Parents. Um, and I, uh, I would like, if you have time, I would like for you to, to read that. Um, because uh, that's what God calls you. He says in Psalm 127, he says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows. In the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gates. One of the things that for church is this. Your children, he says, are arrows. What is an arrow to a bowman? It's a weapon. It's a weapon. It's what you're going to use to conquer whatever you're out to conquer, whatever prey you're out to kill. They're like arrows. That's what we send into our culture, our children. You're to hone those arrows. You're to make sure they're sharp. You're to make sure of the feathers on the end of it so that when you do aim it, it goes in the right direction. Arrows. And, and here under the second paragraph, if you look at that, what, what I've got here is the local church is the only place in society where all seven cultural entities are consistently gathered each week, one at a time. These sectors have been identified as arts and entertainment, business, education, family, government, military, media, and religion. Just think, this church can affect families in every sector of society, of the culture. That you, and I, I would say on a Sunday morning, every sector is represented of your culture. You want to make a difference in your culture? Healthy families make a difference in the culture. Your children are the arrows that you point in targeted directions and send them into the culture. You have trained them. And what we're doing in messing up with our kids is we are not you know, you would never, if, we, if our families were healthy and had these things we're talking about, if they were healthy, what we could do to our culture. And I just want to give you this thought. The Muslims know this is true. Uh, they can move into a country and without ever firing a shot can make that country go to a Muslim country by outbreeding the citizens of that country. And they're doing it. I mean, uh, if you don't believe it, go to YouTube and watch a demographic winter. Uh, it's happening. They move in. They train those kids. They train their children in what they want to train them in. And then they put them into the culture. And they take over without ever fire, firing a shot. That's exactly what God was talking about when he says arrows in the hands of of, of uh, the man and blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them you're going to make a difference on this culture and you're going to do it through your family with your children even when you're gone they will have an effect on, on the future that's you're a warrior parent this is part of my dissertation and you'll see in it uh, I, I, I go into it in, in detail but there are barriers to family ministry and I'd like for you to look at those. I won't cover those on this, but I would like for you to look. What are the barriers to having a really strong family ministry? And then if you look at, if you look at page, uh, well, it's the last page, page nine. There's an integrated church and, church and home family ministry model. Tomorrow we're going to talk about those four things down there. Family fragrance, family tradition, family compass, and family moment. 
I'm going to show you, this is what we're asking you to do. This is the how. We're asking you to take uh, your home and uh, consider these four pillars of your home that will support the church the way that uh, the, the church is uh, supporting you. First of all, the church down here is in the support row and they're resourcing you so that you can do these things and these are the outcomes above it. Um, and it is uh, it works. It's what we do at our church. It's exactly the way our church is, is designed and built. So, okay, I don't want to hold you past what Pastor said. Uh, we are, my watch is not, it's not nine yet. Because you're on a jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much for coming tonight. We do have some snacks and refreshments. That's up. We're starting in tomorrow at 9 a.m. Again, uh, all we're going to talk about tonight is what we put into the how. How, how, do, how do we do this? So, very helpful. I want to encourage you to come tomorrow. We'll have lunch together.